Welcome back, everyone, to the Shock Absorber podcast, and it is, as always, wonderful to have you along with us, and it's wonderful to have Tim with me here. It's good to be here, John. On the purple seats. On the purple seats. I don't think I've recorded in this room yet. Haven't you? No. You've recorded in this seat, but not in this room. Oh, I see. oh we moved the seat into the other room. Yes, yeah. yes, mm. into the other, the other room. <laughs> uh, we are still here at Miranda Congregational Church, a, the church that we are partnering with here at Soul Revival. And uh, you are partnering with me on this podcast? Yes. <laughs> yes, thank you. I uh, will not make fun of what you're wearing today. Well, no, don't make fun. I always point it out, but I'm not going to do that because uh, I was on the chip lunch earlier. I'm wearing a shirt with lemons on it. Yeah. I said, this is representative of my two co-hosts, Braden and Ethan, that when life gives you lemons, you've got to make lemonade. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so I always make a point about people's clothes yeah, for no okay. reason other than... I'm Wasn't looking. the you squeeze lemon onto your chips at the fish and chip shop? No, it's yeah, not. So there you go. Missed opportunity. Interesting right there. point. And then I also said my favourite saying is, you know that saying where people say it's hard to soar like an eagle when you're surrounded by turkeys? No, I don't think I've heard that one. Yeah, it's not, it's like you know I'm uh, I'm surrounded by incompetence. Right. Yeah. I always thought it was a funny saying. I'm sorry to continue bringing your day down. <laughs> <laughs> Another turkey on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank you for jumping on. It's going to be a short one today just yes. because of time constraints. Uh I always like having you on. Thank you. Thank you. You're making the rounds on social media with some clips that you've been from the last oh, podcast you've talked about. That's yes. exciting. Check that out. Yeah. Uh, on TikTok as well, as you, you were right. making a joke about. I have a way of checking that, I don't think. Uh, I can send you the link. Okay, great. <laughs> <How's that sound? laughs> I don't enjoy TikTok either, but you know we're using it for promotional purposes rather yeah, than anything that's, else. that's fine. But if you do want to follow uh, us on TikTok, it's Soul Revival Church on TikTok, so check that out. There you go. That's exciting. Uh, let's start with a cultural, cultural artifact. Yeah, you've been reading a book. I have been reading a book and really have only been reading probably the first 50 pages, but of Eric Metaxas's, Metaxas's uh, biography of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting already. Very well written. Yeah, good. I think. And that's uh, for a biography, that's got top marks from me. Excellent. Because with biographies, they're a bit tough to get through if they're You're just. You're a like, bit of a fan of the biography, aren't you? I don't mind a biography. Yes. I, I like. I like well-written ones. So I think I've said before there's a, there's a five-part biography on Lyndon Johnson. Yes. And it is written by, and I cannot think of the author at the moment. All however, the way with LBJ. All the way. Well, that was a saying when he was yeah. going to, trying to get elected mm. for as president. Yeah. But I've only read up until the point where he arrived in Washington. Okay. And that's the first book, which was 700 pages. Yeah, this is my problem with biographies and actually most history is mm. I'm usually interested in a topic or a person about 200 pages worth. Um, but so much history and so many biographies are like around the 700, 1200 yeah. page mark. And I just don't know if I've got it in me mm. to go that big on one particular moment in history or one particular person. So I, they always intimidate me. I, I think, oh, yeah, I'm... Yeah, you know, you know, the whole Hamilton craze over the last you know five years since oh, the, the musical, the musical, and oh. then that was based off a particular biography. I'm like, oh, I'll dig yes, into that I biography. Have, I have that Ron, oh, Ch Ron Chernow's biography, but yeah, I have not. There read we go. It, yeah. So, but again, like 800 pages, and I just mm. look at 800 pages, and I go, no, nah, mm. I don't have that much time in my life. Well, that's the same. I think I've mentioned on this podcast before is the uh, Ron Chernow again, same guy that wrote the Hamilton biography right. of John D. Rockefeller. Yes, and I. Didn't finish it for two years, and I finished it uh, a few months ago. That's good. It was good, but it was the similar thing you're saying, like, oh, and he's just doing that, and then he's just doing yeah. that. And I think that we'll see how we go with Bonhoeffer's, but Metaxas's one is really well written, like the best one I've written. Yeah, well, good. Best written one I've read so far. I've got a uh, Bonhoeffer biography that holds up my TV, my extra screen <laughs> next to my laptop. Is it? <laughs> it's enormous. I bought it for an assignment and didn't realise how big it was until it arrived in the post. Really? And again, it's one of these like 1,500 pages. Wow. And I read the first three chapters. I knew all about his great-great-grandparents and that was exciting, but then I haven't got past there. So the maybe same. one day I'll go back and read it. But at the moment it props up my second screen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it's the same with the Lyndon Johnson one. It's They go back and to where his family established themselves in Texas. Yeah. Like all the way back to Texas being a frontier state and then pushing into these areas where they're like you could make so much money farming and they ended up realising that the top layer of the soil was really fertile but underneath that is a layer of limestone. Right. And so as they kept farming, it kept throwing all the limestone into the soil and spoiled the soil. So all oh. these people went broke 
because okay. they were on the search for riches and ended up thinking, yes, we're going to make heaps of money in their first few crops. And after that, it destroyed their crops. That's right. And then it goes on talking about how people managed to live life back in the 1800s in a front, frontier state of tech. It was front, 1800s or 1700s? Probably 1800s. And how you had to pick the peaches and then preserve the peaches so you could have them later on. And there's a lot going on there. That was, thank goodness for washing machines, that's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's uh, uh, back to Bonhoeffer biography. It's really good. Check it out if you want to. But it, uh, I'm really enjoying how it's written. Apparently, Bonhoeffer decided he was going to be a theologian at the age of 12. That's quite an aspiration. Yeah, but he'd mm. already decided earlier that, but he hadn't told anyone. Oh, because in his family, it. and his dad especially, was like, you better not say anything unless you've thought it, thought it through very well. Interesting. Yeah, well, that's, that's a German thing. Is it? Yeah, definitely. and you can speak to that. I can speak to that. Yeah, yes. yeah, I appreciate that. There was this uh, joke my dad used to tell, which is not really a joke, but um, <laughs> it's about it, it just goes there was this you know four year old, five year old anyway pick pick a young age child who hadn't said a word, um, and the parents were quite worried mm. about his development, development. speech development, mm. and all of a sudden he's at breakfast and he says. I need sugar on my porridge. And the parents look at him and they say, my goodness, this is the first time you spoke. It's so exciting. <laughs> he goes, why haven't you spoken before? Because before now, everything was satisfactory. Oh, really? <laughs> so, apparently in Germany, that's, that's an outrageous, you know, people will just laugh all day on that because it's so it true. speaks so, so much to yeah, the truth of the thing. Yep. So, well, wow. I find that. I yeah, don't necessarily, well, I actually know I like the sound of my own voice, but I seem to talk a lot. But, uh, no, I don't try not to use excessive words. Okay. Yeah. I'm interested that you, that's the same with your reading. You just said that it was the same with reading biographies. You only want to read the 200 words. You don't want to read the 700. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I love really? history podcasts. Oh, do you? But yeah. you're doing something else at the same time. So. Well, that's true. Yeah, I'm either walking the dog or going for a run or driving what's the, around. What's the most interesting history podcast you've listened to lately? Uh, the I started a number of years ago with Stuff You Missed in History Class. That was mm. quite good. Uh, and then dropped that after a while and I've in the last year have picked up The Rest is History. That's a good one. Yeah, which apparently is one of the biggest podcasts in the world. Is it? So I've heard, yeah. I know we've talked about it on this podcast before, but mm. it's very fun. It is really fun. I don't know if you listened to the Napoleon one, but when Tom Holland started the Napoleon one with an impersonation of Napoleon... Right. It's hilarious. Yes. Yeah. yeah it's it really yeah. funny. I've just finished a series on um, JFK? JFK. I haven't in, listened to including it. Including LBJ's role. Yes. Yes. And whether he was the shooter is one of the conspiracy theories that from two cars back, he was the one that oh, really? made the shot. Apparently, My that's conspiracy a, theory is that he, he arranged it. Right. There you go. But not, mm. I don't think he was the shooter. Uh, yeah. That's a little far fetched, I think. Is it? Yeah. Okay. okay. It's probably a bit hard to prove that one. Probably. LBJ was the shooter. Well, I only say that from reading LBJ's biography and only the first part. But there he would go. do absolutely anything to get power. Interesting. So the first election that he won, a car carrying ballot papers, just a box of ballot papers ended up falling out of the back of the car. Right. And, what a coincidence. And affected the result of the election. There you go. So that's what makes me think of it, but I don't know if that's for sure. There you go. It'd be interesting to hear from you when you get to book three or four or whatever it's sure. going to be that when it gets to about Kennedy's assassination. Yeah, yeah, it would be interesting. Yeah, just to because see I how they deal with that topic. He, I think, doesn't, I think LBJ took the, uh, what's, you know, when they swear you in as a president. Yes. He did that on the plane, on Air Force One or something like that. It was on the plane. Obviously. Yes, they rushed him. Uh, well, once they declared uh, JFK dead at the hospital, yes. they then uh, found out this in the podcast. They fought the medical personnel who really wanted to do an autopsy there, and the Secret Service said, "No, nah, no way, we're taking him back to Washington." So they whisked the whole entourage back to the plane, and that's where, before they even took off, LBJ uh, gets sworn in. Yes, I've seen the photo. Yeah. So yes, that yep. makes it. There you go. That makes sense. Mm. Uh, I think I don't think I mentioned what the podcast was that I've been listening to lately, but it's uh, on the is Arab Israel conflict, right? And it is a podcast from 2015. Okay, and it's on a feed called Marta Made, 
but it is a six part series and every part is three and a half hours. And it wow. traces all the way back from the start about where it kind of happened from uh, Jewish people being persecuted, especially in Russia and Eastern Europe. Yes. And that's yeah, where yeah. it began. Uh, it's quite awful, but it's good to hear. I like to hear the, the real roots of the beginning of what's happening right now in Israel. Yeah, and Palestine. I should yeah, say. it's um, yeah, it's good to be able to listen widely to lots of different mm. perspectives, just to be aware that there's lots of perspectives, uh, and it's to be able to dig into those, and at least to be able to empathise with. Okay, I can understand you feel this because mm. yeah, and you can yep. track people's history back. And I think it helps you with the nuance of Absolutely. situations yeah, like yeah. that, rather yeah. than having a. A strong opinion. It's definitely not something. a situation where there are simple answers <laughs> yes. and simple takes. Yes. Uh, and anyone who's got a simple hot take is just wrong from the start. Ooh. Yeah. That's my hot take. That is a hot take, I was going to say. Wow. Well, pointed at the camera too. Yeah. <laughs> Goodness me. That's a, that's a crazy one. No, I just not, think no it's, sorry, not it's a crazy so one. It, it, it's just so complicated. It is. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, and I enjoy that with lots of things, including even, uh, you know, I like watching football. And people are just like, oh, he's a terrible player. I'm like, well, and I like to find in the nuance and going, well, maybe he isn't terrible, but maybe also he's this and this and this happened. And he doesn't fit in the team, and you know, it's hard for him to adapt to a new country and all those things too. So yeah, well, if you're talking about someone in a Premier League or like in a top league team, then clearly they're not a terrible football player. <laughs> That's uh, right. They're like <laughs> the zero point zero zero one percent of players. It's like the the person who comes last in the swimming in the Olympics. You're like, yeah. oh, you suck. You only came eighth <laughs> in the entire world. <laughs> That's right. In swimming, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think you're 100% right. So like we said, it's going to be a short podcast. Yes. But a couple of things that we thought we could talk about is the uh, you preached on the weekend. I did. And I uh, quoted Bonhoeffer, actually. <laughs> There you go. What How's link? that for a segue? Fantastic segue. I forgot that I had until just that moment. Every time we say segue on either the podcast that I'm on, I just think of those two wheel oh, yes. things that you yeah, can ride. Yeah, the segues. Yeah, yeah. My wife's uncle had one. Okay. And I once saw him riding around Padstow in it. Yeah, right. There you go. With the handles? Like your, yes. the standing one? Yes. Because I've seen a lot of kids around my place with the ones Hover, that are just... Hoverboard things? Yeah, kind of like a hoverboard, but it's basically a segue without the handle. Yeah. Uh, it works on the same gravitational focus, I think. Anyway, good segue that good I segue. ruined. Back to a segue. Like you preached on Hosea? Uh, Amos. Amos, Amos eight sorry. And nine. Hosea was the week before. And what did Amos have to say for us? Well, so we're doing a series on Advent and we're yep. particularly looking at the prophets who foretold Advent uh, and thinking about Advent both as the first coming and also the second coming of Christ. And so the whole season of Advent is counting up to Christmas. Mm. Uh, so Advent calendars and you open the doors and eat your chocolate or whatever it is. Um, but So you're counting up towards Christmas, but actually the whole season is designed that as we count up to and remember Jesus' first coming, that we're actually resting in anticipation for his second coming as well. And so the section we looked at in Amos, uh, chapters 8 and 9, uh, particularly the end of nine uh, is where we get this picture of new creation. Mm. And so we get this picture of what it's going to look like when uh, everything is made, made right. So most of Amos is a book of judgment and it's quite harsh towards particularly the people of Israel. So there are small little snippets throughout Amos on how God is going to judge the other nations around Israel but then he gets to the judgment of Israel itself. Mm. Um, and that's a much longer section and a, and a much more full-on section. And that is because basically the idea is God hates sin, yes, and he hates sin out there, but most of all he hates sin within his people. Mm -hmm. And so he takes the judgment of his people very seriously. So that's the majority of what Amos is all about. And then just in the last couple of verses, all of a sudden you get this big shift from judgment, judgment, judgment to God will make all things new and there will be restoration. And like a lot of the Old Testament prophets, you have this uh, picture which is kind of fulfilled in the return from exile, kind of fulfilled in Jesus and kind of fulfilled in new creation. And so a very typical image of this is when you're, if you're on the valley and you're looking out and you see the mountains and almost like a kid's drawing of mountains, it's just this sketch in the background <laughs> and you just got all these little peaks. Yep. And so... Um, it's like the Old Testament is prophets are looking ahead and they're just saying mountain range and they would they write as if a child is drawing a mountain range. Now, when you actually get to those mountains, you actually realise that there could be kilometres in between 
those mountains. But from your perspective where you were, you couldn't see the distance. All you saw was all the, the mountain range ahead. And so that's a common image that commentators use to talk about how uh, when the Old Testament prophets are prophesying about the restoration of all things, there's a lot of language which you can say, oh, that was when they returned from Israel and they rebuilt Jerusalem and they rebuilt the temple and they rebuilt the walls. Uh, and the answer is, well, yes, it kind of is um, because they did do those things. And yet there's hints in Nehemiah and Ezra, which is where you see those things being rebuilt, that this can't be it because there's people who are sad. It's like this is not as impressive as it was and um, God's spirit doesn't return to the temple in that moment. And mm. so you've got this, Is was that it? Was that all we were waiting for? And you realise, well, no, there must be something else. And then Jesus comes and through his life, death and resurrection, we say, oh, here we go. Here is the restoration of all things. And uh, yes, it is in the sense that he inaugurates the new kingdom. But then he goes up into heaven and says, you know, now preach that gospel to all nations uh, and then I will return. So that was kind of like the second mountain, that it is true that he restores all things in his death and resurrection, but also that's just a precursor for new creation. And so you finally get to the third mountain, which is Revelation 21 kind of picture of new creation. So that's kind of what I painted out in mm. the sermon on Sunday was this God is bringing new things. And the way I kind of set it up was to talk about the uh, the – the world looks like it's hurtling towards disaster and there's lots of things going on. There's the you know, Israel-Gaza war, there's yeah, Ukraine, there's, um, uh, I was going to say Ethiopia, is it Ethiopia? Sudan? No, Sudan, the Sudan mm. um, civil war in Sudan at the moment. Then you've got you know, the climate crises, you've got all these different things that people are anxious about. You've got new waves of COVID coming through. You've got uh, the cost of living crisis that people are stressed about and mortgage and rent stress mm. for people. There's a whole lot of stuff in the news at the moment about NDIS funding and if it's going to suddenly blow out. And So there's lots of things that you look at and go, oh, the world seems to be hurtling towards disaster. I feel like people also capitalise that on weather. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I feel weather. like weather is becoming more of a thing right. to drive people did clicks. Oh, I see. Yeah, so right. I'm sorry to because throw that in. Because it's getting hotter. Yeah. yeah. Well, is it getting hot? Yeah, maybe it is. But Yeah. Well, you keep saying, yeah, the hottest day on record or the driest yeah. summer on record or yeah. the wettest summer on record or like there's all these, yeah, record-breaking things. And I think what they're trying to signal is uh, the climate appears to be changing. Possibly. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, all the climate science is well beyond my expertise. Mm. I only say that because I get, uh, I've seen it in America how they're just like, there's a Category 5 hurricane coming. Right. And then it's like live coverage of the whole thing. Yeah, okay. But then it ends up just like blowing itself out on the Atlantic Ocean and it doesn't even happen. Mm. But, and I, I guess part of that is, I mean, there's always a narrative. So there's always, yeah, what's the narrative behind that? Um, but you've also, I mean, particularly in America, when you've got the cyclones that come through the Gulf of Mexico, mm. I mean, you had that horrendous one in New Orleans, yes. which killed thousands and thousands of people um, because there wasn't enough warning. People didn't take it seriously. So right. now they're kind of err on the side of, now you've got to take it seriously. Yeah. And we've seen the same thing in Australia with bushfires. Yes. So we've had you know, horrendous bushfires come through and people um, either barely escape with their life or don't um, and die in the bushfire because they just go, oh, yeah, it's just bushfire. And so, you know, they're always talking about how do you change the ratings, how do you – help it, people to realise, no, no, catastrophic means you need to leave Yes, because we cannot save you if a bushfire comes through and you are in this place. And so, mm. yeah, I think part of it is that kind of signalling as well. Yeah, sorry, I don't mean to make light of actual natural no, no. disasters. It's just that sometimes it's like there's a 35-degree day coming and we don't know what's going to happen and people are going to suffer. Like, yes, yeah. I think Australia's had 35-degree days Well, for any before. UK listeners, that would be like if it reaches, you know, 25 or 30. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I hope we've got UK listeners. We've got a listen, yeah. Message underneath... Talk in the comments. In the comments. Yeah. Let us know where you're from. Yeah. Now, I threw that in about weather to the height and I kind of hijacked what you were saying. So I thought you were doing really well explaining. The one thing I was going to ask you though, that idea of the three mountains, where did that come from? Oh, I don't know. It's there. It's an old analogy. Is it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've learned it well back in Bible college and I don't think it was a new idea then. Oh, okay. So, yeah. It's okay. a pretty common... Is it? I'm image. sorry. No, no, no. As in like, you know, it's, it's often talked about when you try and talk about Old Testament prophets, what were they seeing? Yeah. Um, and the, the realisation that particularly those ones who are pre-exile or exile, 
you know, were they seeing the return from exile? Well, yes, they were. Were they seeing Jesus? You, well, yes, they were. Were they seeing new creation? Well, yes, they were. But they, the language is blurred all the way through, and it's only this side of resurrection that we can see uh, the distinction between those things. And then, so as I said, I hijacked what you were saying, but no, then right. you kind of posted, the, the, sorry, uh, illustrated the idea as like we have the hope to look forward to. Yeah. So I, I use this line like it seems like the world is hurtling towards disaster. Uh, um, yes. And I said, but actually the message of the Bible and Amos, the last few verses of Amos 9 is actually the world is hurtling towards hope. Mm. Um, so we, we're in an inevitable collision towards hope. That's um, pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, I was just trying to like bring out that idea that um, as Christians, we, we can be assured of new creation. We can be assured that this is where the world is heading. Mm. Um, and that then reshapes how we identify ourselves, how we think about the world, how we engage with things like politics and wars and climate science and um, you know environment care. and like It actually shapes all of those things yeah. if we remember that actually the world is hurtling towards hope uh, and who we are in that because of Jesus. Mm. I found that helpful. I think it might have been the last sermon. No, it's the first sermon of Advent that Stu preached that I heard. And he was talking about how there's a lot of, why hasn't Jesus come back? If he's coming back, why hasn't he come back? And a big part of his sermon was, well, that's because God isn't done saving yet. He hasn't yeah. finished. And I, I like that because that paints an, paints an idea of we can have hope that more people are being saved, but also because of the big hope that you're talking about, we're hurtling towards hope that we've got that to look forward to. Yeah. Mm, so I think that was really cool. In the interest of time, let's move on. Mm. Uh, you wrote a rather feisty article. <laughs> And I'll put the link in the show notes for this article. Uh, in response to a, another article that was written on the Gospel Coalition website about youth and children's ministry? Uh, yeah, it was particularly about youth ministry. Yeah. Uh, and so, I, I mean, being someone who's passionate about children's ministry, I'd sort of weave that in there as well. But mm. um, there, there was lots of great things about the article and I try to notice those at the front top of my article. Um, and it was... Uh, the the article is called Youth Ministry is More Than Friday Night. Uh, which is very true. Which, absolutely. Mm, as a and, heading, yes, yeah, very true. Yeah, totally. And there were lots of really great points. So we're talking about how discipleship is more than Friday night. You've got to think about during the week, how are you encouraging your young people to grow in their knowledge and love of Jesus? Um, and it's more than this Friday night. You're also thinking about who they're going to be in the future. Um and so there was lots of good things in there that I really appreciated. One of the things that frustrated me when I read it was uh, so much, well, actually the, the entire uh, pitch seemed to be um, we do good youth ministry now because of who the young person is going to be and going to become in the future. So there's a lot of talk about uh, future ministries. So uh, a couple of the quotes, you know, what is it going to take to get someone like Jill from a current youth group attendee to a future youth group leader? Uh, which is a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, but then another one, yeah, how does a kid in year one grow in their maturity in Christ so that when they're in their 20s, they are faithfully committed to Christian? Um, you know, good youth ministry works towards becoming an adult member of the church community. And that was the tone all the way through. The thing that frustrated me was it kind of triggered for me a number of conversations where people – see the value of children's and youth ministry not in the immediate now and not because children are the church of today but because this sort of aspirational hope that the children will, will be the church of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's just enough of that still lingering in the conversations that I have and the, the things that I read online that it, it made me kind of a, a little bit grumpy and I was like, oh, I've got to write this. Yeah, So I wrote it down and I sent it to, to my colleague uh, who's awesome and she said, yep, here's all the places you need to turn that down. So I did. Um, <laughs> she's great. And um, But uh, but essentially, the, the, so yes, the original article was Youth Ministry is More Than Friday Night and so I titled mine Youth Ministry is More Than Future Fruit. Uh, and so the idea being that because – children and young people are disciples now, um, it's not just about who they will be. We're not, I'm not doing children's ministry now because I want leaders in 10 years' time. I'm not doing mm. children's ministry now um, because it's planting seeds. Um, I, you know, I'm doing good children's ministry now because these young people are disciples of Jesus and I want good youth ministry now because they are or at least have the opportunity to be disciples of Jesus right now. 
Uh, and so that was the sort of the frustration that the article raised in me uh, was, sure, like, I, I mean, I am concerned about their future growth. I am concerned about, you know, having leaders in the future and, you know, in 20 years' time having these people be active adult members of churches. Of course I care about those things. But that is not the leading reason uh, of why we want to do effective youth and children's ministry now. We want to do effective youth and children's ministry now because they are disciples and we want them to know mm. Jesus, love Jesus, obey Jesus, and to continue to do that. Um, and so, yeah, that was just the kind of thing that was was in my mind. Um, mm. Well, yeah. I love your passion about it. I think it speaks to a little bit of an idea that I'm trying to work out in my mind. So let me put it out and see mm. what you think. That God is a lot more and and both, and or both, rather than either or. Right, yes, sure. So uh, truth and love, God is both. Uh, sanctification, or justification and sanctification. Now justification needs to come first before sanctification, but they both work together in different ways. So it's not one or the other, it's both. I think it's similar in this scenario, and I, maybe I'm drawing too long a bow, but... Youth ministry is great now, for now, and also for the future. Yeah. What yeah, do you think? Yeah. Absolutely. And so I had um, uh, one person on Twitter come back to me and say, where was his little comment? Um, he said, yeah, I wholeheartedly agree that youth ministry is more than future fruit, but it's not less than either. We don't want to conflate mm. caring about future discipleship with just being instrumental. Mm. And... Uh, and I replied and said, yeah, sure, of course. Uh, so exactly what you said. It's not either or. Uh, it is definitely both and. And so what I was noting in this other article was there was no no uh, expression of the importance of the discipleship right now. It was so future-focused. Um, and, yeah, I've had enough of those conversations that made me realise, no, 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 we need to keep fighting for uh, and arguing for, articulating the uh, need for good children's and youth ministry because of the young people who are in there right now who are disciples of Jesus. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's kind of like saying, I want to do good ministry to middle-aged people now because so that I want um, our retirement villages filled with mature disciples Christians. of Christ. <laughs> like, well, I mean, <laughs> sure, but isn't it also about them right now? No. Don't you want the 40-year-old now to be growing to, to be hmm. knowing Jesus and loving Jesus. You don't just want them to be a fruitful member of a retirement village in yeah. 30 years' time. We could have more fruit now and later. That's right. Yeah, we don't have to choose. Um, hmm. And I, that was the kind of expression that I was trying to... And, and I, we don't talk about that, about middle-aged people, uh, because we assume the church is for them. And so this is part of it as well, that... Uh, I think we keep having to have these conversations in youth and children's ministry because there's enough of a uh, lingering feel among some that it it's not quite for them. It's not really for them. Uh, maybe they're not really just children. They're not sorry. They're not really disciples. Um, or we would say that they are, but we don't act like they are. Um, and is trying to help communicate. No, no, they. They deserve the best possible ministry that we can give them now because of who they currently are. Yes. As well as, of course. Yeah, who God has who made them be. to be yeah. at that point in time. Yeah. And yeah. in 80 years' time, I want them to be active, fruitful members of a retirement village as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. But <laughs> that's not why. I mean, that's that's God's you know, work in them, sanctifying them, as you say, mm. for the next 80 years. Mm. Uh, right now, I'm doing my best possible job helping mm. them to know what it looks like to love Jesus, obey Jesus, uh, and know him be, as a five-year-old or a 15-year-old. Yeah, definitely. Good way to finish. Thank you. You need to head off. Yeah. Thank you very much for jumping on too quickly. No worries. I, want to think, I think we can keep talking about that. God's not either and or, either or, he's and and both. I think we need to, I need to delve into that more. Both and, yeah. It speaks more to his character and his omniscience and... Uh, yeah, I'm, I haven't got it right yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think um, probably another time we can come back and talk about some of the stuff that Christopher Watkins writes in Biblical Critical Theory because right. a lot of his diagonalization is his big tool. This is just starting a whole new can of worms. <laughs> but he's trying to uh, – it's not quite a both end. It's a little bit both end, but he's trying to say we, we notice these dichotomies all the time 
Um, and it's not that they're false dichotomies, but they're noticing different mm-hmm. aspects of who God is and how he works in the world. And here Christopher Walken's big argument throughout the entire book is we need some sort of, uh, yeah, I don't know if he'd use both hands, but he, he uses this word diagonalization, which basically is the they're both noticing true things. And so when you notice dichotomies mm-hmm. happen often, you're both noticing true things, overemphasizing a part of it, underemphasizing a part of it yep. to the detriment of the other. Fascinatingly, that's a really big book that you've read. Uh, it is a really big book that I've almost finished reading. <laughs> well, you, you have, this is like me with the Rockefeller yeah. biography. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you, Tim. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you to anyone that's listening and watching. We really appreciate it. If you want to add to the conversation, email me, joel at shocklessorbit.com.au or you can throw a comment in the YouTube comments. And tell us where you're from. Tell us where you're from and what you thought of Tim's article. <laughs> we'll finish with a one way. One way. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.